Okay. So in, in this recording, this is week six. Um, what I'm really hoping is that at this point, you've learned a few basic things um, from the three classes combined. So the first one is I want to think about English 12 and think about the difference between making an argument without evidence and making an argument with um, what would be called academic or, or legitimate evidence, meaning reliable sources that have a pattern uh, of being used in a variety of different settings. Um, I think that you probably got enough feedback uh, for Professor Ulmer on that, and then I just want to kind of then compare that to legal reasoning or governmental reasoning. Um, what we're doing in the PL51 class is that it's the same process, but now with the addition of adding reputable sources. So a couple of you did that in your first paper. Um, I'm not going to criticize the reputable sources at this point because I think you know at least you're using sources. They're not th those were not great sources, um, but they're they're fine. They're adequate uh, for at this point in your college career. You'll learn how to use uh, better sources. Um, I'll point out a few, although I have pointed out quite a few during the week five videos. So if you need a refresher on that, right, you should go back to the week five videos and look just for the sources that I'm using that I quote to. Um, feel free to email me. Uh, we can set up a discussion about how do you play this game of sources because it's a, it's a complicated game within, within college. Um, then, you know, sociologically, you should be learning about deviance now and then putting that into the more or less the framework that you've learned from Professor Parker uh, about how structures influence behavior and how they influence your mental model, those being really the same thing. Um, so I want to try to bring all three things together uh, as you start to think about this revision of your letter. Uh, what we started with is a letter to your future self. So you were trying to make predictions about what might change. I want to be harsh at first and just say everything always changes. So uh, any of you who thought that nothing's going to change, I think I understand what you are trying to say. And so you should say that thing. Um, you, you can be cynical. It's OK, right? I mean, people are cynical in life. Um, I don't know that that's a very scientific position to take. Uh, but if you're going to be cynical, you're going to have to back that up with sources, with evidence. Um, and that is going to be difficult uh, to do. Again, if, if that's unclear to you why, then you should for certain be looking at the pluralism video that I talked to you uh, about on YouTube. Um, so when we think about change, we want to be much more specific. We don't want to say broad, sweeping, general change, like the world is going to change. Um, when you take your biology class, you'll understand why that is a silly thing to say in social science because it means something very concrete in biology. Um, but we want to try to, I'm going to work from left to right here. We want to check what, what is this process, right? So we've got one character in Parable of the Sower who is doing the kind of critical analysis that Professor Parker is trying to teach you in sociology. She's asking these deep questions that are very particular. They're not big, broad questions that don't have any answers. She really wants to find out the answers. And then so she seeks out data. Uh, she's reading books on a variety of subjects. She's testing those theories that she's learning uh, in those books uh, against what she observes and perceives and experiences in the real world. Um, and now she's trying to sh share that uh, positionality or that, but that perspective uh, with this other individual. Um, who you see, you know, in this picture, it's pretty great, right? On the one hand, she's she's leaning back, like, what, how, how dare you tell me these things? Uh, and that is largely what people do. And so um, for those of you looking at climate change, you know, it's the people who are denying climate change science aren't denying the science. They're denying you. They're denying the scientists. Uh, they're not, the, the information is not walking up to them and talking to them and they're saying, I don't want to talk to you. They're saying they don't want to talk to you. So there's something wrong with the way you're trying to deliver the information. So if you grew up in a religious background and you still kind of have that mental model, 
then fear and guilt are probably good ways of motivating you to do something. Uh, but if you didn't grow up in that religious tradition, fear and guilt are going to be meaningless uh, to the person who's hearing you. So if you're saying, you know, you should be afraid the world is going to end, that person's going to look at you like you're nuts. And so there's no amount of science that you can deliver to them uh, once they think that the reasons that you're putting these arguments forward are based on your belief system, not based on science. So the delivery of the information is just as, as important as the information itself. So she realizes that in this scene, and so she shifts her behavior. She changes, she adapts, and says, look, I want you to take possession of this book, right? If you take possession of this book and you take notes, then you, know, you can spend all the time you want criticizing, reflecting on it. And that's really what we're trying to get people, uh, again, using the example of climate change, to start to think about. We don't want them to think about all of the components and pieces of climate change. We want them to think about one of them, and it should be the one that's most you know, closest to their experience. If they live on the coast, then sea level rise is a, a game we can play with them, not so much to scare them, but to help them understand what it is they need to do in order to adapt to that reality, that scientific fact. And that's what she's doing here. The first step, obviously, is you're going to have to seek out data, and you're going to have to record that data. You're going to have to organize it. And that's what Professor Parker is, is really trying to teach you to do um, in the course. So I want us to think about our past selves for a second. Uh, you might go back to what you wrote uh, in your letter to your, past, to your future self, and I want you to write a letter basically back to that person. Now, if this is getting too confusing, right, then maybe spend the weekend uh, watching Back to the Future um, or the TV show Lost, right, where they're going back and forth. I, the goal here is not to confuse you. The goal is to, you took a position a couple weeks, well, you took a position at the beginning of the semester saying, this is the most important issue uh, to you. Almost everybody changed their mind uh, by the time I had you write down uh, a letter. Um, when you wrote the letter to yourself, I think most of you did a good job of clarifying what it is that you're concerned about. Um, but then when you tried to come up with solutions, you really struggled. Um, and those, even the, even the people who came up with solutions, they were, they were so overly broad uh, that it would be impossible to even you know, reduce those things down to like three steps. Like in order to bring the world together, uh, step one, send out a massive invitation, right? Uh, and the invite can't just be digital because you know, 65% of the planet doesn't have a computer. Um, you know, so this is what we're trying to say. Like pick something much more manageable uh, as a solution. And again, the real goal was for you to look at the, the, the political uh, solutions, right? And not just the Republican or the Democrat solution. So I gave you examples of mothers against drunk driving, you know, Black Lives Matter uh, in week five. So I think you need to think about, you know, those people who are participating in the pl pl political process are trying to put pressure uh, on, on folks in Congress and at your city and local uh, level government. So, you know, in Professor Ulmer's class, you're being asked to write a letter to the mayor. So now's a great chance. If you're concerned about climate, share, climate change, what do you want the mayor to do about it? And what can you do uh, to get that person to kind of pay attention? But I want to now shift us over as you're kind of thinking about from your perspective to other people's perspective to now use the role power diagram that you've been working with uh, and that we've been hopefully trying to repeat over and over time. I want you to start thinking about how the abuse of power leads to this consciousness of resistance or how the recognition or when I see somebody abuse their power uh, that we either implicitly, meaning we, we, we didn't really talk about it, but we believed it and we acted as if we believed it, or explicitly, we definitely talked about it, we definitely wrote it down. Uh, when you violate or when the other person violates that rule, uh, even if I'm in a powerless position with you, um, that awakens my consciousness, right? I start to say, wait a second, this isn't fair, right? There's all these kind of questions and, and, and strategies that I come up with. And so we want to see this product of complaining, um, which bluntly, right, that's what most of us do, right? We complain about these problems. And then we want to start putting it into the concept uh, that we have in, in law and politics of foreseeability. Um, you shouldn't really complain about something um, when you can do something about it is the general idea. Certainly, if I can't do anything uh, about a problem uh, or I perceive I cannot, uh, complaining is obviously one way of, of dealing with that problem. But I want to take you out of this. So we're going to take the stop and frisk example that came up 
uh, in class. And so we want to use the traditional roll power diagram again. Um, so the person with the power, I think here, I'm going to shifting this a bit, uh, is the judge, right? And so the judge is ruling on whether this stop and frisk scenario um, is valid, is warranted. And then the police officer who's been accused of violating uh, this rule of not stopping and frisking, um, you know, they're in the, the powerless position there relative to the judge. Um, so we want to ask the two questions, right? You know, what should the judge do in the sense of, you know, what is the, what are the benefits that he's going to get for basically saying that the police officer uh, was okay in what he did? Um, and then what are the limits of his, of his judicial power? You know, um, I'll, I'll answer both questions and then you'll keep thinking about it. The first one is, you know, the, the judge is more likely to work with people who are going to pressure him to support the police officer's position. But he's also more likely to have this mental model of without police officers, there would be anarchy, right? Many of you also share this point of view. Um, the judge is likely to believe this because he wants the police officer uh, or police in general to protect him uh, when he goes out into society. Now, it is likely that that occurs for him, um, although he might also consider um, private security, right? Um, whereas the police officer, you know, what are they giving up in that, in that relationship then? Well, they're no longer protecting the community, right? They're protecting individuals which we find to be in power. And so, you know, the, the police officer now is participating in this unequal power structure, um, you know, which the judge kind of initiates here. But then what are the limits of the judicial power? Uh, you know, all the judge can really do is write a judicial opinion or make a decision uh, about the law. So if we move over here to the right and you look at the orange, um, you know, did the police officer owe the individual who was um, frisked a duty not to frisk them? And I, this is going to be confusing for some of you, but under the law, no, there isn't, right? Uh, the policy of stop and frisk was declared to be unjust, and the police department is being monitored. But there is no judicial rule, there's no law, there's no case that said this is the law and if somebody does this they have a duty uh, not to do it. And there's been no legislation. Now that might change, right? And that might be one of the things that you would write to the mayor. You know, I'd like you to make this a law, make this policy now a law that there's consequences if somebody violates it. Um, so in short, if we were in my law class, you know, I teach two law classes, um, this would be the end. We're done. The judge can get out of this. He can make no ruling uh, simply by saying that there's no duty. The police officer does not have a duty not to stop and frisk people. Now, that sounds crazy, right? But legally speaking, that's correct. So let's bounce over to the other side, the pink side here, and look at deviance and see if we can have a, a, a more satisfying answer. Um, you know, what, what is the deviant behavior in this case would be the question. Would the deviant behavior be the judge maintaining the unequal power relationship where police officers can stop and frisk whomever they want? Or would the deviant behavior be the police officer's use of stop and frisk? Um, and that being out of the status quo of policing in the United States. Now, I, I've been on ride-alongs um, with police officers, and I'd say... It isn't so much that police officers don't want to stop people because they don't want to write things up. Um, in fact, most police officers that I've met, aren't, they aren't uncomfortable with writing up their reports. Um, what they're uncomfortable with is the lack of resolution. So if they are not able to resolve a conflict between two people uh, or resolve, if somebody complains about something, they want to be able to give an answer to that person. Um, and so the reporting process is the thing that's guiding the mental model of policing. They have to write a report, so to deviate from that reporting process would be the, the deviance, right? That would be the unusual act. In this case of stop and frisk, there's actually a lot of reporting. And so if the police report that they violated this judicial rule, uh, then they would get in trouble. So I'm just hinting here, what are the police officers likely to do? Well, what are their material conditions, right? They live in an economy that's going down, right? Um, 
people are starting to complain if I turn on the news about crime going up, right? I don't have any evidence from economists that the economy is going down. I don't have any evidence from the police department that the crimes are going up, but the news says so, right? Um, so what are people's mental model going to be about this social responsibility? What is it they want the judge to do? Well, people who believe that crime is going up and that the economy is going down are more likely to say the judge should allow the police to do whatever they need to do in order to keep crime from going up. Now notice they're ignoring the economy problem. People who think that, who've had the experience of policing, um, over-policing in their neighborhood regardless of what the crime rates are or regardless of what the economy is, uh, would likely like the judge to hold the police accountable for violating this policy. But note that this is a structure problem, right? That there's a pattern of relationships among these different groups that aren't the same. Police and judges have different interactions than police and people uh, of color. Police and wealthy people have different interactions than judges and lawyers, right? So everybody's mental model is gonna be a little bit different about this concept of social responsibility based on their material conditions. And so when we think about role power in this case, it's, it's a challenge, right? Um, so I wanna jump back over to try to think about the mental model from the police officer using you know, our friend here on the left's uh, uh, point of view. If I am living in a, in a quote high crime area, let's say Brownsville um, or uh, uh, Flatbush, you know, according to NYPD, then I would probably be prepared, right? I would foresee that the police are more likely to use stop and frisk like tactics uh, as the economy continues to decline, meaning uh, as more people become unemployed in Brooklyn, especially in those areas, um, I would anticipate that police officers would use more aggressive policing tactics. Um, on the other hand, right, if I'm a police officer, I would avoid those areas uh, in order to avoid the points of conflict and reduce my possibility of getting in trouble. So we have two very different mental models, I think, um, based on the material conditions, right? The police officer wants to keep their job. There's a lot of people uh, who are upset about police relations. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're going to be very, they're going to act as if they do have a duty not to stop and frisk. Whereas other people are going to be anticipating um, that as the economy goes down, the more policing will go up. And so they'll change their behavior that way. Now, all of this is to say that the structure of law here uh, for judges and how they're going to make this decision is ob obviously, right, apparently radically different than how people are going to experience stop and frisk in their own neighborhood. Um, you're never going to hear any of the police officers talking about duty, breach, cause, and harm. This is not going to come into their head. Uh, you're also never going to hear anybody on the corner screaming out, there's been a breach of the duty in the stop and frisk encounter. Um, and so, you know, these social relations, uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, are being driven largely by what folks are paying attention to in the media. Uh, and the media, from a structural point of view, from an institutional point of view, makes money by exaggerating stories. Uh, so people are going to, you know, fall into these traps uh, and what Professor Parker was kind of showing you was the psychological point of view. Um, you know, and this is almost like a loop that just kind of continues. But again, that's the loop of the people in the neighborhood. That's not the loop of the judge. Uh, and that's likely not the loop of the police officer. So my point here is that as you write your letter, I want you to start separating the groups. So no more of this the government, no more of the world or the people, uh, no more black people, white people. Uh, you know, you want to start to be much more clear about which neighborhood are you talking about. Uh, if you're going to compare two or three neighborhoods, what are their names? Um, what are the largest demographic groups? You've seen lots of uh, maps now about income, immigration status, um, you know, and there's lots more research that you can do. So I don't even really, I mean, you know, Republican and Democrat is kind of a meaningless phrase in New York City as well. So we want to start thinking, you know, what, what are the political ideologies of these groups of people? And then finally, most important, 
uh, I want you to really keep thinking about what is your point of view of participation and start understanding that that's gonna be different than other people around you. And this might be something you start talking to your friends and family about uh, and even each other about is how do you view uh, participation? I told you I, I'm a constructionist point of view person. Um, Helen is kind of in between a pluralist and a constructionist. You might ask Professor Parker and Professor Ulmer, what is their position? What do they think? Um, and then I want you to start thinking about ideal and real, right? We might say something, I wish that everybody would do it this way, uh, but it appears to me that, right, this is how it really is. Um, I hope that's not confusing. If it is, please do let me know. Um, we're at that very difficult point in the semester where I need you to start taking the ideas and applying them and kind of leaving behind or amending, discarding, changing some of your earlier points of view uh, before you had these ways of seeing uh, government processes.